Good morning, everyone. The reading is Matthew chapter 20, verse 1 to verse 16. The laborers in the vineyard. For the kingdom of heaven is like a master of a house who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. After agreeing with the laborers for a denarius a day, he sent them into his vineyard. And going about the third hour, he saw others standing idle in the marketplace. And to to them he said, you go into the vineyard too, and whatever is right, I will give you. So they went. Going out again about the sixth hour and the ninth hour, he did the same. And about the eleventh hour, he went out and found others standing. And he said to them, Why do you stand idle here all day? And they said to him, Because no one has hired us. He said to them, you go into the vineyard too. And when evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his foreman, call the laborers and pay them their wages, beginning with the last, up to the first. And when those hired about the eleventh hour came, each of them received a denarius. Now when those hired first came, they thought they would receive more. But each of them also received a denarius. And on receiving it, they grumbled at the master of the house, saying, These last worked only one hour, and you have made them equal to us, who have borne the burden of the day and the scorching heat. But he replied to one of them, Friend, I am doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for a denarius? Take what belongs to you and go. I choose to give to this last worker as I gave to you. Am I not allowed to do what I choose with what belongs to me? Or do you begrudge my generosity? So the last will be first, and the first last. Thanks be to God for his word. Thank you, Judy. I don't know about you, but I've uh, really enjoyed uh, the worship this morning, and it's just been uh, great to have Michael share the word and, and uh, for the songs that we've sung. It's also such, uh, so encouraging to hear that Sophie's engaged, and uh, it's just, that's a real delight to me, and uh, um, I'm excited for you both. Keegan goes to uh, Papakura Baptist and uh, my sons tell, tell me he's a really good bloke. So get to know him. He's here this morning and uh, uh, Sophie's uh, trying to show him off, I think. So uh, let's pray. Lord, we thank you again for your word, uh, your word which is living, uh, which is active, which is able to do a a fantastic work in our hearts. And uh, we pray that you would do just that this morning in our hearts, in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, one of the uh, prevailing attitudes that uh, seems to have captured a large group of our our society is a sense of entitlement. Uh, That is... Uh, People think that because people have certain things, then they think that they're entitled to them as well. Uh, And they think that others should uh, supply them or pay for them. And and that uh, sense of entitlement is not something that is uh, necessarily unique to New Zealand. I was watching a program on 
on television recently and uh, from Australia, and uh, that sense of entitlement is uh, uh, prevalent over there. It's a phenomena that uh, is all around the world. People feeling left out or people feeling hard done by or people feeling that, that things are unfair and that they're getting uh, a raw deal. Uh, and of course, uh, this is not a new thing. Uh, it's been around since the beginning of man. And here in this parable, Jesus shares, uh, that Jesus shares, we see this coming uh, through, don't we? People believing they were entitled to more than what was agreed to. Uh, it's a story about an employer who uh, hires at different times of the day and then pays them all the uh, same amount. Uh, and on the surface of it, it seems unfair, doesn't it? Of course, those who had worked uh, a lot longer were upset and, and some that hardly worked at all still received the same amount as those who had worked the longest. It's really a story about a, how a 12-hour day was rewarded the same as those who'd worked a, a one-hour day. Uh, there doesn't seem to be any bonuses or overtime payments. Uh, in, in fact, the employer rebukes those who, who grumbled. How is it then Jesus, that Jesus can say the kingdom of heaven is like? How is the kingdom of heaven like that? As I've said in the past, parables are a, a, a snapshot of uh, what Jesus' rule is like. Uh, they give us an insight into, into how King Jesus will reign uh, in his kingdom. Uh, now, if we uh, were to read this, uh, parable or the story in isolation, we might think that the reign of Jesus is actually pretty unfair. Is Jesus really an unfair employer? Uh, does he really pay everyone the same despite the, the work that they do? However, when we put the story into the context of uh, Matthew's gospel or in the context of the uh, previous chapters or even chapter 19 uh, of what comes before it, I, I think we find that it is uh, not that unfair at all. But Jesus is amazingly gracious. He's amazingly kind and undeserving uh, to sinners like uh, ourselves. And the important thing you notice when you're studying this passage is found at the end of chapter 19, verse 30, and then in chapter 20, verse 16. Look at chapter 19, verse 30, the last verse. But many who are first will be last, and the last first. But many who are first will be last, and the last first. And then chapter 20, verse 16, so the last will be first and the first last. The last will be first and the first last. Note then uh, uh, that what Jesus is saying is highlighting that thought. Jesus is showing that the kingdom of heaven is unlike how we might uh, think today, or even then, uh, that the kingdom of heaven turns things on their head so that the first will be last and the last will be first. That what might seem the norm here in this world is not the norm in Jesus' kingdom. Jesus' kingdom is uh, of a different nature. And of course, we we saw that in uh, chapter uh, 13 in the those series of parables way back then. Instead of the idea that Jesus would ride into Jerusalem on a white horse and and conquer all before him, Jesus rides into Jerusalem on a young donkey. He he is rejected by many, and his subjects still have to contend with an enemy who is sowing seeds in this world. We see it in the previous chapter when uh, the rich young ruler comes up to Jesus and asks, what must I do to have eternal life? 
We see it too with the, 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 when the children come to Jesus and the disciples try to send them away. Here we uh, see it's not necessarily the winners of this world that will win, but the, what this world considers as losers. Let's then look at this passage and see what it's all about. And there are three things that we notice about this passage. Firstly, the master employs. Uh, secondly, the master pays. And thirdly, the master rebukes. Those are the three points. So firstly, the master employs. Um, verses 1 to 7. Well, at certain times of the year, but especially at harvest time, a vineyard owner uh, needs more laborers. We, we often are told of the, the shortage of laborers in Marlborough where there are many vine vineyards, so much so that uh, uh, workers have to be brought in from overseas to reap the harvest. And uh, it's, it's in a couple of months' time or a month's time when the harvest is ripe, uh, you'll hear an outcry saying, we need more people from overseas. Well, the master of the vineyard here goes into the village early in the morning, uh, 6 o'clock, and he hires some workers. He offers them the going rate, a denarius, which was a... a, a what was paid for a labourer for a day's work. It was a fair day's pay. Uh, there doesn't seem any hesitation on the part of the, the, the workers. Uh, I'm sure they were pleased to be offered a job. Uh, for the vineyard owner, it's vitally important that he, he gets his uh, crop harvested. In fact, the vineyard, vineyard owner is so keen to get them harvested, he goes back to the village, he, he hires more workers at 9 o'clock, and then at lunchtime, and then at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, and then he even goes back at 5 o'clock in the afternoon uh, and hires some more to get the job finished. He offers to pay them what is right. Uh, perhaps he thought it was going to rain the next day or maybe it was Friday and the next day was the Sabbath and he didn't want to work on the Sabbath. I don't know. But the impression, though, as you read this story is that the master of the vineyard perhaps feels sorry for these folk that are wanting uh, work and he sees them standing around idly doing nothing uh, and so he offers them a job. Uh, look at verses 6 and 7. And about the seventh, uh, about the eleventh hour, he went out and he found others standing. And he said to them, "Why do you stand here idle all day?" Uh, perhaps there was no dole those da at that time, and so here they were, just standing around, waiting to be offered a job. And they said to him, "Because no one has hired us." He said to them, "You go into the vineyards too." There's a sense of compassion here, isn't there, from the vineyard owner. Uh, for those wanting to work, he, he hires them. The vineyard owner is obviously a very generous man. He offers them a job. However, the point that I think that Jesus is making is this. How do these workers get a job? How do they get a job? It's only through the master hiring them, isn't it? or calling them to come and work for him. And so, and, and so it is for those in the kingdom of heaven. The only way to get into the kingdom of heaven is through Jesus calling you, or Jesus hiring you, choosing you. Uh, why do I say this? Because if you look back in chapter 19, the chapter that we looked at uh, last week, in verse 13, people are bringing children to uh, Jesus and the disciples uh, rebuke them. Uh, they, do not want Jesus, they don't want Jesus to be bothered by children, these kids. The kids in those days, you see, had no rights. They had no value. They were pretty much considered the lowest rung on the ladder. And Jesus rebukes the disciples for their attitudes and for their actions. He says, let the children come to me, for such belongs the kingdom of heaven. 
You see, while the disciples considered the the children unworthy of the presence of Jesus, Jesus didn't. He saw them as part of the kingdom of heaven. In other words, the kingdom of, in the kingdom of heaven, the last will be uh, first and the first will be last. But then in powerful contrast to uh, this incident with the children, uh, in verse 16 of chapter 19, we have this incident of the rich young ruler. Uh, But not only is he rich, uh, but as we see here in uh, verses 18 to 20, we see that he's lived a pretty good life. He's honored his mother and father. He hasn't lied. He hasn't committed adultery. He hasn't stolen. He's loved his neighbor as himself. Now, you would not get a more upright person. He's the sort of bloke you want your daughter to marry, wouldn't you? And so here the person here has social standing. Uh, one you would expect to find in the kingdom of heaven. He has everything going for him. I'm sure he'd make a wonderful church member, even an elder of the church, a fine recruit for the kingdom of heaven. But this man does not enter into the kingdom of heaven. He doesn't enter into the kingdom of heaven. In verse 22, we see that he goes away exceedingly sad. He's incredibly unhappy. Now, even the disciples were perplexed about that. Uh, They would have welcomed this guy into the the kingdom and uh, beginning to wonder, well, who can enter the kingdom of, of heaven? If this guy can't, who can be saved? And Jesus' answer is in verse 26. Uh, Jesus looked at them and said, with man, this is impossible. It's impossible for anyone to enter the kingdom of heaven. But with God, all things are possible. And of course, this is what Jesus reiterates in this parable, that salvation is God's work. That just as the master does the hiring, so it is Jesus who calls people into his vineyard. Only God can bring people into the kingdom. It's the reverse as to the way most people think today, isn't it? Most people think that they can choose when they come into the kingdom of heaven. Uh, That it's up to them to decide. I think it's very presumptuous for us to think like that. For example, none of us would presume to walk into the managing director's office of Fletcher's and say, give me a job. We'd be told to get on our bikes. And yet, for some reason, most of us think that we can decide to enter the kingdom of heaven, that we are doing God a favor by coming to him and being part of his kingdom. Here in this parable, Jesus is reiterating the point that he's making in chapter 19, that salvation belongs to him. He does the hiring for the kingdom of heaven. And of course, this is what Jesus says in John 15, 16, when Jesus said, uh, you do not choose me. I chose you and appointed you that you, that you should go and bear fruit. As we see here, the master hires right up to the 11th hour. And of course, we see that at the cross, when right at the 11th hour, the thief comes to faith in Jesus Christ. Today, you shall be with me in paradise, says Jesus. The master employs. He is the one who does the hiring. He is the one who calls people into his kingdom. Secondly, the master pays. The master pays. Look at verses 8 to 10. Uh, We note here in verse 8 that the master instructs the foreman uh, to pay from the last to the first. Interesting, isn't it? Pay from the last to the first. 
And what is astounding here is that those who have worked an hour got the same pay as those who'd worked all day. Each received a day's wages no matter how long they worked for. Can you imagine how those who started at 6 o'clock in the morning felt getting paid the same amount as those who started only an hour uh, uh, ago, you know? And yet they were paid what had been promised. So what's the point that Jesus is making here? Well, surely it is that God gives to us out of his grace and not because of our labor. You see, in the end, the employer did not have to hire any of them, but by his grace, he hires them. Salvation is not on the basis of personal effort, but on the basis of grace. It's not on the, uh, on the basis of how hard we have worked or how good we have been, but through grace and grace alone. Uh, again, we, we, we see that the, the way the world uh, thinks has been turned upside down and back to front. That like the rich young ruler who hoped he could make it through personal effort, uh, through obeying laws, from doing uh, what is right, he found that he, he couldn't do it. But Jesus shows us through this story that the, the kingdom of, of heaven's principles are so different. They're on the basis of grace. You know, so often we think that salvation is on the basis of personal effort. Uh, for example, one only has to go to a funeral and listen to a person uh, uh, leading the service. So much of what is implied is that because this person has been good, has worked hard, has uh, been well respected, that they are deserving of heaven. You see, this is the point that Jesus is making in chapter 19. Which is more deserving? Uh, the child who has done literally nothing for God or the wealthy and good and well-respected young man who's tried to do everything for God? And yet Jesus says the kingdom of heaven belongs to those like a little child a little child. Salvation is not given in proportion to, to what you have done. And look what Paul says. It's, it's, it's all through the Scriptures, this. Look what Paul says to Timothy in 2 Timothy 1.9. He says, Who saved us and called us to a holy calling. It's an effectual calling. Not because of our works, but because of his own purpose and grace. It's not because of anything we have done, but because of God's purpose, God's grace, which he gave us in Christ Jesus before uh, the ages began. Or Paul again in, in Titus 3, 5, he saved us not because of works done by us in righteousness, but because of his own mercy by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit. You know, this is in direct contrast to the world, isn't it? And to how the world thinks. We think that if we do such and such, then we deserve so much. But here we're reminded that this is not the way King Jesus operates. He operates out of his grace. He operates out of his mercy, out of his generosity to sinners like us. Of course, uh, Matthew is, is believed to be writing to Jewish Christians about 45 years after Christ. Maybe he has them in mind as he writes and he puts this story in his account. Maybe uh, uh, these Christians are struggling to come to terms with the fact that, that Gentiles and other undeserving types are, are coming to faith and are being included, and yet what have they done? And you know, we can sometimes think like that. We can sometimes think like that. 
these people who have just come in and, and, and want to be involved, who do they think they are? These people who have, who have just come off the street and who have terrible reputations, who do they think they are? They haven't proved themselves yet. And yet the kingdom of heaven belongs to people such as these. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 1, 26 to 29, he says, For consider your calling, brothers and sisters. Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many of you were powerful. Not many of you were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even the things that are not, to bring to nothing the things that are, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. You see, God's grace is for all. It's not just for those who seem to work the, the longest and the hardest. It doesn't matter what socioeconomic uh, uh, group you're from, how old you are, how young you are, how, how wealthy you are, how poor you are. God's grace, his undeserving love, is poured out on those he has called regardless. You see, regardless of who we are, none of us can get into the kingdom of heaven by our own merit. It's only through grace. It's only because of Jesus' righteousness are we saved. He was the perfect lamb, the one without blemish or spot, the perfect sacrifice who shed his blood for us. He died once and for all the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God. You see, this has implications for us, doesn't it? It saves us from our pride. There is no place in the kingdom of, of, of God for a superior attitude of thinking that we are more important or of greater value than the person sitting along the row from us. You know, just because... You have been here longer or because you've always been a Baptist doesn't make you better. Why? Because we have all come the same way through God calling us to himself. All who are in the kingdom are there irrespective of their merit. You see, there is no place in this church for a higher status. You know, most of you will realize how much I'm not a fan of being called a Pastor Richard. And the reason I'm not a fan of that is that uh, uh, I don't want people thinking that I am superior than, in, to any one of you. I labor for Christ like all Christians are called to do. Some of these laborers thought they deserved more. But the master was generous to all of them. How dare we think that, that God is not generous to those whom he has saved. He has saved us out of his abundant mercy and grace. And lastly, the master's rebuke. Look at verses 10 to 15. You know, as we see, those who worked longer hours grumbled that they'd only received the same pay as those who'd worked less than them. Surely they thought they were worth 12 times more than, than those who'd only worked one hour. Look what they say in verse 12. These last worked only one hour. And you have made them equal to us who have borne the burden of the day and the scorching heat. The owner had made them all equal and they did not like it. It was unfair. We're entitled to more. That's what they thought. But Jesus takes them aside and he said uh, two things to them. First he said that he paid them what he promised. 
He paid them what he promised, that he had kept his word, that he had offered them a day's work for a day's wage, which was a denarius, that he had kept his side of the bargain. The master had done nothing wrong. He'd kept his contract. And the second thing Jesus says is in verse 15, am I not allowed to do what I choose with what belongs to me, or do you begrudge my generosity? You know, these workers could not come to terms with a generous owner. They couldn't come to terms with that. Uh, They had an attitude problem. All they thought about was themselves. It never occurred to them how generous, how loving, how gracious, how kind this owner was. The fact that God allows anyone into his kingdom is a work of grace. Regardless of what we have done, who are we to tell God how to behave or what to do? The fact that He chooses any of us shows what a loving and gracious and kind and merciful God He is. You see, God is the owner and the Uh, of the kingdom, Uh, and the kingdom of heaven is his to give to whom he wishes. And and if we grumble about this, then then somehow we're throwing doubt on the nature and the character of God himself. And so Jesus finishes with this parable, so so the last will be first, and the first last. In other words, Jesus turns our worldly values on their head. How dare we grumble at God and think that he is unfair. The fact that he chooses any of us shows his generous grace to sinners such as ourselves. You know, whether we've been Christians like Fred and Dulcie for 80 years, or whether we have been saved in the last few days. It doesn't make any difference. You know, the fact that uh, any of us have been called is a marvelous work of grace. Truly, it is by grace that we are saved through faith, and that not of ourselves. It is a gift of God not because of anything we have done, lest any of us should boast. Let's pray.